I am going to introduce you to an individual who is not only brilliant, sharp, but compassion, considerate, caring, and I know this man for probably a little under two decades, and he is just terrific. He is a very busy man, and somehow I coerced him, I cajoled him, I pressured him to come down to the studio from his busy schedule to come here to talk to you so that you can learn a lot of interesting things all about your heart and how, who knows, maybe you could live a little bit longer just from listening and hearing the things that Dr. Richard Schlafmitz, the chairman of cardiology at St. Francis Hospital, has to tell you. Did you like that opening? Well, you know, <laughs> if you say nice things like that about me, I'll come more often. <laughs> it's great to see you, Richard. Thanks. It's terrific Thanks. to see you. Thanks. You're wonderful, and you got a great sense of humor, and you're just so knowledgeable. Let's get right down to it. Sure. Um, this is a little bit controversial right now, so we're just going to hit it, and then from there we'll go back into describing things. Okay. People are talking about in the newspapers, unnecessary stents are being placed in blood vessels during, uh, you know, a cardi cardiac or a coronary, uh, for coronary conditions, etc. that are, you don't really need to do it. Do you? Don't you? What's going on? All right. Well, it's a great question, and it is in the paper and in the press, and people are always concerned. Are doctors doing unnecessary procedures on patients? Uh, before I answer that, if I can, let's just give some basics so people understand what's going on. Take it away. Your heart's a muscle. It pumps blood around the body. All the tissues and organs in your body need blood. In order for every part of your body to work, it needs blood. That's the um, gasoline, if you will, of the body. Mm -hmm. And the way that gets around is via your heart. Your heart pumps that blood around. But although the heart is a pump, it needs to get its own supply of blood. And it gets it via coronary arteries. And there are three coronary arteries. And the way you could look at a coronary artery is it's sort of like a garden hose bringing water to a lawn. Mm -hmm. If you have a kink in that hose by the faucet, your whole lawn doesn't get watered. Correct. And if it's out by the fence, it's a little patch of grass. So where you have a blockage in a coronary artery determines how important the blockage is. But once you have a blockage in an artery that limits flow, it's going to cause symptoms. We always call those symptoms angina. Angina is just a word to describe a symptom that you feel when you have a blockage in an artery. Mm -hmm. When you have a blockage in an artery, that's where the controversy with stents comes in. If you have a blockage in an artery, if you don't fix that blockage at a certain point, that artery can close, and that's what a heart attack is. A close or it becomes obstructed? Same thing. Okay. Obstruction and closure. Usually it's a combination of things. You have a cholesterol plaque with calcium, a blood clot form that shuts off the flow. And just like that garden hose, if no water got to that lawn, you get a brown lawn. Mm. If no blood gets distal or past the obstruction or closure or stenosis, the muscle dies, and that's a heart attack. So angina is the warning or the symptoms leading to let one know that you have a problem. Mm -hmm. And a heart attack is when the artery closes. And once that damage is done, heart attack is dead heart muscle, you can't fix that damage. That's permanent. The heart can't regenerate. So our job is to diagnose when someone's symptoms are related to the heart. If you have a blockage, determine do you need medication, do you need a stent, or do you need a bypass? And there are different ways to assess that. The controversy now is, well, we make these diagnoses of blockages. Do we necessarily need to put a stent in every person who has a blockage? Mm -hmm. And in any area of medicine or law or business, there are some people who do things appropriately and some people who don't. So I'm right. sure right. Um, stents are sometimes going into patients who potentially don't need them because the doctor is putting them in for financial reasons, which the paper might imply. Mm -hmm. But I think most of the times that doctors are, are, are going to be pretty ethical about it, and that doesn't mean that a stent's not going in necessarily. What I mean by that is when you're taking care of a patient, you need to determine what's best for that patient. But, you know, you're not God. And sometimes you say, I see a blockage, and I think it's going to be right to put a stent in. And sometimes you see that same blockage and say, I'll try medication. If you knew in advance which way was the best way, 
then that would be perfect. You don't. But sometimes you say, well, the blockage is not critical. I'm going to treat with medicine, and the patient has a heart attack. You'd feel pretty bad if you didn't put a stent in. And if you put a stent in and then you have a problem with a the stent, then you say, gee, why didn't I treat with medicine? Damned if you do, and if it doesn't matter what you do. So, you know, I'm sure there's some validity to ex excessive stents going into patients, but by and large, I think most doctors are, are doing it appropriately. And in fact, um, at St. Francis, as well as other hospitals in Long Island, to address that issue, we have certain criteria that we use for all our physicians after the procedure, and we check to see that the criteria that they're using is appropriate. So not only do we check it on a monthly basis in our conferences, but on a quarterly basis, we have a quality assurance committee review statistics and criteria that our doctors use to mm -hmm. put stents in. I love this conversation. Watch, you'll see where we're gonna go now. So now you got the stent and you discussed it and you gave, you gave a reasonable response. Let's talk about testing. Testing is also another area where one can say, the physician says, you know, listen, I mean, I can keep testing you and testing you and testing you, and we're going to spend a million dollars just in testing you. Where does one draw the line? What kind of tests are we talking about? What kind of information are you going to get? When is enough enough? Okay, well, the testing is probably one of the main reasons why the healthcare system is in the problem it is financially. Um, it's a combination of patients' problems where they want everything tested, they don't want to miss anything, a doctor who doesn't want to be sued so he's going to test for everything, right. he wants to make his patient happy. And then a combination of both where you're doing the appropriate thing. So, um, and, and then there are the doctors trying to make money on testing. So you put all that into it and you get a lot of testing done. And the mm -hmm. question that you asked is, what testing is appropriate, when is it enough? And when I teach medical students, I tell them that the most important test that you can order for a patient is to talk to them. The history. The history is by far the most important information. You can go for an echocardiogram to look at how the heart is pumping. You can get a stress test, either a nuclear stress test or a stress echocardiogram, to look to see if there's decreased flow going to the heart muscle. But at the end of the day, what your patient tells you is what you're going to listen to. So if somebody comes to me, and I think that they may have angina, a blockage in an artery, the first test I might order is a stress test. And I'd probably order a nuclear stress test where you get on a treadmill, you exercise, mm -hmm. and they take a picture of the heart at rest and exercise, and they label the blood cells to see if there's decreased flow going to the muscle. That mm -hmm. implies a blockage. Now, that test is not 100% accurate. And you may have symptoms that, to me, sound like angina. And the stress test comes out 100% normal. But you say, Rich, I'm telling you, every time I walk, I get tightness in my chest. I stop, it goes away. I used to be able to play tennis. After the first set, now I can't breathe. And I say, gee, well, your stress test was normal, Harvey. You know, I mean, stress tests don't lie. It's a test. And you say, I don't care what the stress test shows. I don't feel good. Well, you listen to the patient, and the stress test is not 100% accurate. You go to the next test, which is an angiogram, and then you look at the actual artery. So to answer your question, testing really relates to the patient's symptoms. If a patient's not that symptomatic, and you prove to your satisfaction that they're not in a life-threatening situation, you don't necessarily need to run a billion dollars worth of tests. Mm -hmm. Okay. Use your, uh, to Cl the doctor. Clinical the doctor judgment. Clinical judgment and your gut from all of your experience and what you think is right. Don't just look at numbers. Correct. Okay. These are important things that my viewer needs to hear this. Let's get a little specific right now. What's the difference between like a balloon angioplasty, you got bare metal stents, and drug eluding stents? I'm throwing all these words out, but I want you to make that so people will understand what you're talking about. Okay. So you have a blockage in an artery. Right. We determine that if you leave it alone, you run the risk of a heart attack. We need to fix it. You have a choice of either having a bypass operation or what we call a percutaneous coronary intervention, which includes angioplasty, which is a balloon alone, you take the balloon out, a bare metal stent, that's a piece of metal that you leave in the artery after you balloon it to expand it, mm -hmm. but it has no drug on the lining of it, or a drug eluding stent, which has a drug lining the metal. And the drug will do what? Okay, so in the natural history of angioplasty, mm -hmm. when angioplasty started and we started doing balloons, all we did was balloon angioplasty, the success rate was maybe 70%, and the restenosis rate, the ch chance of the blockage coming back, was probably around 70% also. <laughs> Not too good. 15% of the people you did went for emergency surgery. Not, Not so too good. good. I would keep my wife up all night getting paged in the middle of the night with people closing their arteries. So angioplasty was an advance 
because it opened up the door for us to do new things. But it really was a primitive technique. It saved somebody from surgery sometimes, but you could only do it in limited cases, cases where it was a straightforward single blockage in an artery, where the artery wasn't tortuous or calcified, and you didn't have great results. Around 10, 15 years after the um, uh, introduction of angioplasty, we came up with the idea of stents. A stent is sort of like a spring on a pen. Mm -hmm. and it scaffolds the artery, and that revolutionized what we do. It took the success rate up to 90, 95%, pretty wow. impressive. And the restenosis rate, the chance of the blockage coming back down to around 15 to 20%. Wow. Better, but yeah. not, perfect. Right. not perfect. And you can do many, many more blockages. The problem with bare metal stents is the metal in the artery actually caused the cells in the artery to cause a scar called the fibroblast. So at the site that you put the stent in, a scar would form, and that would cause an obstruction to flow as well. On itself, absolutely. So it's not a cholesterol blockage building up again, but it's scar tissue. And that's what would cause the restenosis. Well, mm. some very bright people thought, well, why don't we come up with a drug that will inhibit the fibroblast, the cell that makes the scar tissue. Make it not work for the first three yeah. to six months when scar tissue forms. And if we knock that out, Maybe we we'll knock out restenosis. And that's exactly what happened with drug eluding stents. Now, it's not a drug released around your body, so there's no risk with it. It's totally focused. It's focused at that one spot, maybe 15 millimeters. And that drug inhibits the fibroblast from causing scar tissue. And the restenosis rates went down to less than 1%. Wow. And if you look at the trends since drug eluding stents have been out, the decrease in open heart surgery has been dramatic, where the increase in stents have gone up. So the, the good news is you don't have to open up a bo uh, body, you don't have to crack the chest and have someone in the hospital right. for a week with the risk of surgery. Right. When we do it in angioplasty in a stent now, you could go home the same day, we could do it through the wrist, we could do it through the arm, through the groin, but it's basically you can go back to work the next day. So the downtime to um, the workforce is negligible and the discomfort is minimal. So it's really tremendous advances with stents. And now, you know, there has been some talk about bare metal versus drug eluding stents. The real issue with the two is that when you have a drug eluding stent, you have to take a blood thinner for a fair amount of time. Six months? It's actually longer. It's up to two years now. Wow. And it's not Coumadin. It's uh, either Plavix? Plavix or Effian is actually what we're using more often now. It's something that inhibits clot formation in the stent. And that's one of the issues with a drug eluding versus a bare metal stent. With a bare metal stent, you only have to take it for a month. So let's say somebody needed to go for surgery in two months. Um, I might put a bare metal stent in them because I could take them off the blood thinner. The risk is the restenosis rate is higher. But ideally, for the average person coming in who needs to have an artery open, most physicians would agree a drug eluding stent is the best treatment because we don't see you again. We fix it and you're done. Hmm. We spoke before going on the air and other times as well, and, you, and, and, I, and I love the idea. And that is that we're going to talk about diet. We're going to talk about food, and we're going to we're going to film you cooking. Okay. We're going to, and we're going to make comparisons. So we're we're going to do that probably in the next few months. We're going to set aside the time. We're going because that'll be great. But what I would like to do now is not do that show, but just take a couple of minutes. So let's just talk about prevention, and then we're going to come back to this stuff again. Because you know, my viewer says, oh, wait, a minute, "Wait a minute, I don't want any of this to begin with." Right? Is this something that the my viewer that people can prevent, or genetically, it's going to happen to you? Okay. Well, what causes coronary disease? Is what it comes down to, and how could you prevent it? You know, some people you can't prevent it; it's going to happen, but. As you point out, the majority of the people, you could definitely have an impact. And, um, you know, the first thing is diet and exercise. It, Am Americans are overweight. You need to lose weight. And I don't care how you lose weight. I don't care what diet you take. You can, there are 55,000 different diets out there. You know, it's basically math. Less, you know, calories, you lose weight. So you need to eat less, cut your portions down. Mm -hmm. And that's what the cooking show you were talking about. What we do is we've been making a bunch of different uh, recipes of the routine way you would eat and one that decreases your cholesterol um, input and calorie, caloric input, so it's a heart-healthy kind of diet. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, I don't follow that at all. <laughs> <laughs> but I know. <laughs> <laughs> but for our view is, you know, if you eat properly, and exercise, that's one of the most important things you could do. Other risk factors are diabetes. I mean, if you do have diabetes, you need to watch your sugars extremely carefully because diabetes will cause blockages in arteries in all parts of your body, your head, your eyes, your kidneys. Mm. So 
Diabetes is a risk factor which is tremendous, but also can be controlled. Tremendous advances in the treatment of diabetes to help control it. Another thing which is difficult to control, but is also one of the major risk factors, is smoking. If I look at my patients who are under 50, if they don't have diabetes, then they're smokers. And if you stop smoking... So smoking and diabetes are the two biggies. Two biggies. And then diet and exercise. You do all those things. And then there are other things such as high blood pressure and then genetic things like high cholesterol, which we give medications. But if you do all that aggressively, the studies are showing that there's less chance you're going to meet me in the hospital. Mm -hmm. The diet is so important because I know when I went on a diet, um, just another way of eating, uh, lots of vegetables and fruits and cut back, no red meat and on and on. I mean, I didn't even have to take any medications. Yeah, I it, mean, it's it'll help your blood pressure, it'll help your sugar, and it'll help your heart. It's amazing. It really is. Okay, so let's get back now to what happens when we do meet you, <laughs> okay? All right, so um, uh, w when, when do you do bypass surgery then? Well, ideally, you'd like to never do bypass surgery. I mean, when a patient says to me, um, Gee, should I have bypass or I have angioplasty or stents, when do I decide to do a bypass? Mm -hmm. Most surgeons... And, and, and there's no controversy. It's not like a surgeon and a cardiologist are fighting for a case. If you come to St. Francis Hospital, the surgeon sometimes will say, hey, you know, guys, why don't you do stenting? It's, you know, it's less risky. Mm -hmm. The surgeon doesn't want to have a complication. So clearly there's less risk with angioplasty stenting versus bypass. What's the difference in hospitalization between the two? First of all, if you come in for uh, a stent, you come in that morning, you may go home that night, you go home the next day, back to work the next day. That's great. The, the pain is minimal, maybe a little pain at the groin site, but it's really a minimal um, in terms of pain and discomfort, and you get back right away. Now, who wouldn't want to do that? I mean, you know, it's like... <laughs> in you, comparison you, you, to... Now, what surgery? So surgery is I do the angiogram, and I look at the angiogram, and I say to you, you know what? I do angioplasty, but it's not going to work for you. It's not going to work long term. You're going to be back here in three months. I'm not going to get a great result. I'd love to do it for you, but it's not the right thing for you. The right thing is surgery. What, what will show you that you won't get a right, a good result? When I the do the history, the angiogram. When I do the angiogram, I can look at the anatomy of the arteries, and I can tell if the stent's oh. going to work. So while I'm doing the angiogram, if I can fix you, I'll fix you right there with a the stent. Right. 